Spark today, uh, the <clears throat> framework on top of the framework, basically, for uh, Laravel. Um, oh, that's my dog, Moose. Uh, he's super scruffy, really fun. Um, so I'm a, a little bit about me. I'm a developer at a company called Metric Loop, um, and we're building an application called Helix, which is a software as a service. Um, it's really a, a people management software. It's what we want to uh, strive to be, um, whether it's customers, vendors, um, employees. We're going to give you a resource to put all of your people into one system. Um, please get at me on Twitter. I'd love feedback about the talk. I've done this once before. Um, I'd love... Uh, some more feedback. Um, uh, oh yeah, and Helix is built on Spark, so uh, I know a little bit about it. Um, so to to get started, we'll be talking about what Spark actually is, um, why you might want to use it, um, but the meat of it is going to be kind of looking at the documentation and seeing uh, some choices that were made, but also um, maybe making the case for getting it or um, giving you reasons to uh, look in further. Um, and then we'll have, we'll look at some code that we have running and then um, Q&A for anything that I may be able to help with. Uh, but first, what is Laravel for the uninitiated? Um, it's a rapid application development uh, framework. So uh, it gives you really modern tooling to um, develop applications really quickly. Um, they push really hard to be a part of the cutting edge with uh, when it comes to PHP. Um, I think the next version coming out is going to require 7.0, which that'll be out in July or something. Um, they have really great documentation. It's something you could actually read kind of cover to cover and uh, take it all in and kind of be even just better informed about how the framework uh, operates. Um, and it does have a growing ecosystem. All of these things listed are either wrapped up as components inside the framework or exist uh, because the framework exists, like server management, um, OAuth 2 servers, stuff like that. Um, and then the, the community is just great, um, really encouraging, really helpful. Um, so moving on, what is Spark? Um, it's basically a boilerplate on top of Laravel, uh, specifically for brand new SaaS applications. Um, it's built on Laravel 5.4, um, which kind of pushes you to be kind of very current. Um, and then it's also it also costs money, so it's a hundred dollars for a license or three hundred for unlimited license licenses, um, and that's basically uh, a product a project that makes it to production. Um, if you only have one, you can start as many SaaS projects as you want, um, but until you make one into production, uh, that license will only be valid for one. Um, and it costs money because it was built ground up by Taylor. He spent a lot of time on it. And um, I'm hopefully going to make the case that this will save you weeks of dev time and $100 is a drop in the bucket compared to a full-time developer hacking away on this stuff. Um, so the next kind of thing that we're going to look at, the meat of this is going to be the documentation, what Spark does out of the box, um, and why you might want to use it. Uh, so to get started, it's a command line installer. Um, that requires the Laravel installer. And this will basically just download all the stuff and put it in the right uh, structure, folder structure. Um, when you buy a license, you'll, give, you'll have the chance to uh, get a token from the Spark site. And you'll plug that token into the command line, and it'll actually verify your license and then allow you to continue downloading the code. Um, but then after that, it's kind of honor basis <laughs> on whether or not you want to uh, share it with people. Um, so the, I guess the first real big thing is when you kind of start looking at your application is what is it actually going to do? So you want to start focusing on um, the API and its capabilities. Um, so here we're going to look at uh, how Spark has enabled you to create kind of an API-driven um, application. Um, and so first to get started, uh, if you want to expose your API to outside uh, people where you can actually uh, run like a curl command, um, you just use this Boolean in your service provider to turn it on. Um, if it was a false, then it, it kind of wouldn't accept uh, any API requests. Um, so one of the things that your users can do when they sign up for your, uh, for your application is they can create tokens for themselves um, if the API is turned on to true. They can create tokens for themselves, which gives them the chance to access 
um, the back end, all the API routes uh, with a, a specific token that then authenticates as themselves. Um, and you can create tokens here within the service provider and give them different uh, abilities. So um, that way you can say, I want to create a token that in this instance, I want to read servers only. And so that token only has access to do read servers. Um, and then you have to do the, the checking logic there uh, on your own. Um, and what does that look like? This. You basically just grab the, the authenticated user based on the token. Uh, you read that token and then you read the actual, uh, what it can do. Um, and I believe you can also do a cannot uh, for that. But then after you make that check, uh, you'll be able to kind of carry on. Um, for the routing, uh, with Laravel 5.3, the way that they structure the uh, routes is that it's in two different files, one called web and one called API. And what that does, it allows you to kind of use your front end routes like your login or your dashboard to be in the web folder or in the web uh, file. And then API routes uh, to live on their own. That way they're not, you're not kind of having to put a big giant file. So this is what this does. The, the router will actually create a group around this API file, um, give it a proper namespace. So in our application, it's the HTTP controllers uh, with an API. So whenever a controller is listed in our routes file, um, it actually looks in the API namespace. Um, and then we'll also put in a middleware on that for the API. And that'll just mean, uh, I think it does like maybe throttling on connections and uh, can't remember the other things. Um, and then it also puts a prefix. So this is where you could say uh, like your app.com slash API slash, and then you define your routes. Um, this might be helpful for like, I don't know, API versioning or something. Um, but this at least confines all of your routes into one uh, area. And then of course it just includes the API file. Um, so this is what it would look like if you were to create a token, if your user was to create a token and maybe issue a curl request or hook it into some other service. Uh, you would just attach API token on the end. They would drop that in there and then they would have access. Uh, to do that, you'd have to add an authentication um, API guard on that route or a group of routes to make sure that uh, the token is actually caught. And then it would return, like in this instance, if you were trying to grab all the users, it would return valid only if that token passed. The other thing this does is it gives you the chance to uh, really separate concerns. Front end does one specific thing, back end does another <coughs> specific thing, where um, the front end would actually like load up a dashboard or something and say you want to grab um, you know, your, your list of events for the day or something like that, you want to hit a separate API route called like, current events or something. What you would do then is um, using Vue.js, it would actually create a token for you, like kind of in the background magically, I and mean, you can follow the stack trace, but uh, what it does, it creates a token for you, uh, sets it in the database, and then sends it off, uh, kind of intercepts the uh, request, um, drops it into the header, and then when it authenticates to the back end, it'll pull that uh, token out, read it, make sure it's valid, and then destroy it and keep going and kind of give your data back. So uh, with using Vue.js, you don't have to do any intercepting, any transient token creation. You don't have to do anything. It just kind of works out of the box. Um, and Axios is the Vue.js uh, request, HTTP response thing. Um, it used to be view resource and then they deprecated it. So the other thing you can do if you don't want these uh, API tokens created by Spark is you can drop in using Laravel Passport, which is a full OAuth 2 server that you can just kind of drop in. And uh, there's a whole resource on how to install it and get it working. Um, and it'll tell you in that documentation to use the Passport facade. Uh, because Spark takes over everything, you would need to use the Spark, but that's pretty much it. And then you have full OAuth 2 um, support for your application. Um, so that's all well and good, but you're making this app to make money. So um, this, we're going to just look at the billing, kind of how it's configured, and some choices that were made there, um, and how to kind of hook into it. So out of the box, it supports Stripe and Braintree as payment gateways. 
Um, we're using Stripe. It's just wildly easier. Uh, and you just set your environment variables um, appropriately. And then you would, from the Stripe dashboard, point all of the events to a webhook Stripe URL. Uh, it was just app.com slash webhook slash Stripe. Uh, that way, when an invoice is paid, Stripe can hit that webhook. And Spark has the code in place to actually handle that webhook. Say, ah, invoice is paid. Store that in the database. And the when the user then logs in and wants to look at their invoices, it's already there for them. This is, again, nothing that you have to configure. Um, so if you want to create plans, obviously you would have like a maybe a pro level, a basic level. Uh, you may want to offer discounted pricing for year subscriptions versus month subscriptions. So you would create your plans in Stripe, for instance, and you would tell uh, your application here which plan to access, uh, whether it's the monthly pro, yearly pro. Um, and you can see the first parameter in both of those plans matches pro. So what Spark is able to do is read both of those, see that the difference is that function call to yearly, and it'll actually build an interface to toggle between monthly offering and yearly offering for you. You don't have to do anything else. You can just set it up like that. Uh, it's really, really convenient. Um, so you can, from the very beginning, like say you want to only build teams, because um, right now, out of the box, no configuration options. It's a user billing, so every user that signs up has to subscribe to your plan. They start paying for it. Uh, you can also wrap that up and say, I want to do it for Teams. Um, or you can do it for both, kind of like GitHub does. I'm going to pay for my private repositories over here, and my organization is going to pay for theirs over here, and I'm part of both. But uh, So that's really nice that it offers that. Um, and what you do there is literally the exact same call, except it's team plan, except for plan. Um, and Spark will kind of build that out and make all the associations uh, for you. And you can set different constraints on that, but I think we're good there. The other thing you can do is archived plans. This is really nice to uh, prevent people from using a plan that you don't want to offer anymore, but you don't want to screw your existing customers into losing their service. So you have some outdated thing, you want to archive it, it's no longer available if somebody wants to upgrade their plan, and it's no longer available as a new plan to choose for new users. Um, but if you have somebody still on it, they can keep charging that one. Um, you can kind of push them off in some ways, you know, make it harder if they have that plan uh, before you actually delete it from your system. So that's a really nice kind of way to grow. So there's also, uh, obviously, if you have uh, different tiers of paid plans, you're going to have different constraints for why, uh, for going between plans, you know, upgrading to something, downgrading back to something else. Uh, you want to make sure that your users are always going to be valid when they're doing that. So based on the user and the plan given, you can actually check stuff. So in this instance, it's really silly, but if they're trying to choose the, the pro plan, but they have more than 20 to-dos, then we're just going to return false and say, no, you can't make that change. <clears throat> but this one is kind of weird because it just fails silently. It doesn't really do anything for you. Um, in this same exact thing, you can actually throw an ineligible for plan exception and give a reason behind it. That way you can actually consume that on the, on the front end. Or you can actually create a class called eligibility checker, and it can be called whatever you want. Um, but you can create a new class and create a handle function, and that way, instead of putting all of that billing logic into your provider class, you can just create another class and kind of wrap it up there, and then just make this call, um, and it'll spit it, out, spit it out over there, do all the logic checks, and then uh, come back with the appropriate response. Um, obviously, you want to check if stuff if people are subscribed. So subscribed, team subscribed. If it's behind that middleware, it'll catch it and spit out an appropriate response. Um, that's kind of nice. Um, the default is to not accept a, or not require a card up front when they're signing up. Um, this is what happens is you kind of sign up, you give your information, you don't put a card in, they put you on a generic trial. Uh, in this case, it would start a generic trial for 10 days or a team trial days there. And what you would do is you would read the user and you'd actually look for if they're on a generic trial. So that means they've started, but they haven't chosen a plan yet. Um, and that's kind of a really low friction way to get your users in and on your platform. Uh, the other way is a little bit maybe more traditional 
is the requiring a card up front, giving the plan that they choose a number of trial days, and then when that trial ends, it would automatically charge them for whatever they signed up for. Um, that's probably going to be annoying. I don't know how many of y'all have signed up for like the 30-day thing, and then like you get a $16 bill from Audible, and you're like, I didn't want that. So anyway, it might be annoying. You might have to deal with refunds, but it is a possibility there. Uh, you can also just offer site-wide promotions for new registrations. Uh, you create the coupon code in Stripe, and then you drop that code in here, and maybe you offer once a year a 40% discount, you know, at like Black Friday or something. That allows you to do that really easily. Um, there's nothing in place yet for redeeming coupon codes. Uh, if you were like advertised somewhere, like on a podcast, and they turn in a code and it gives them like a 10% discount, there's nothing to to do that yet. Uh, you'd have to manual manually do that, but at least site-wide promotions is in there. And then these are the events that are fired. Um, they're pretty simple. They make a lot of sense. You can hook into them if you need to. Um, maybe you just send a little notification to your team, to your development team that somebody else has subscribed. You can have a party for it. I don't know. Um, so the other really cool thing that, uh, so you have the, the API, you know, guiding you to separating your concerns. You have the billing where you're actually going to, out of the box, be able to start charging and making money on your app. Um, this gives you a unique insight to how your app is actually working and actually growing. Uh, hopefully it is. So what you have is uh, a dev middleware, and that forces anybody trying to access those routes to be a developer. And the developers are defined by just putting in your email address into the developers array. Um, and then that gives them, that gives you unique access into the background of uh, Spark, which is called the kiosk. Um, so what's included, you have a place to make announcements to your users. Uh, you have a place to look at metrics and um, really fun thing, impersonation, which I'll show you later. Uh, so if you want to create an announcement, super simple, just give it a little text field. You type out your announcement. It may be something like um, new feature rolling out. Here's a blog post on how we developed it or here's a blog post on how it works. Uh, give them a link to do it, and then fire off the, send off the announcement. And whenever somebody, whenever one of your users or any of your users log in, they'll have an announcement tray to look at all these announcements from you. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. It's actually really, it's a really great way to kind of uh, update your users on what's happening. Uh, and if you wanted to fire or con listen to that announcement created, you could. Uh, so the other thing that you get here in the kiosk is metrics. So it actually tells you some revenue numbers, uh, growth numbers, uh, subscriber numbers. Um, and that's a, it's just a really nice way to kind of get uh, a big overview of what your application is doing. Uh, every night you can trigger a command to run. This is what the scheduling command looks like in uh, Laravel, where you'd actually run a command called Spark KPI. And it goes through and adds up these numbers and then drops it into a database. And then when you're in the kiosk and you're looking at the metrics page, uh, it'll give you a graph over time because at every night you have updated these uh, records here. Um, so that gives you even a bigger picture. I think it's like maybe 14 days it, it looks back uh, to kind of see your growth there. Um, notifications. So... This is, if announcements are a way for you as a developer to talk to your customers, notifications are a way for customers to talk to customers. Um, and basically just kind of lighten up that bell and saying like, oh, so-and-so liked your photo. That's what that, this would be. Um, so first off, with uh, the newest versions of Laravel, it's a command line to create a new task complete, or create a new notification class. In this case, it's going to be task completed. So create that. And then you would, uh, in that class, you actually set in the via function that you, you want to use the Spark channel as the avenue to deliver this notification. Um, that could be anything like uh, the Spark channel, mail, SMS, um, Slack, whatever it is. You can kind of choose per notification what channels you want to send it out on. And then for each of those channels, you can define what it looks like. So for this one, I'm saying when I send this to Spark, I want it to look like this. It's going to be a Spark notification. There's kind of an action text to take, a link to, link to um, 
and but this would also look like to SMS, and it would just be like what the text message actually actually looks like, or to mail, and you would actually you know give more information for a mail message for this notification than you would for a text message. So it allows you to customize that, and then to notify the user. So uh, you know if, if we're working on a team together and I need to, I, I complete the task, you can fire off one of these events to notify the other person that was on that task or something. Um, and it's really simple, either notify the user on the notify function directly or use the facade to send a new notification. And if you do it with team member or with teams, um, it'll actually send it out to everybody on that team, which is really nice. The other thing that you're going to be doing is dealing with customers. You're running a SaaS application. You have customers now. So support requests is going to be important. And out of the box, yes, it does require Vue.js to work. But what it does is you basically just set a support email. And then whenever somebody clicks on this support uh, pop-up, they'll have the pop-up. They can fill it out. And it'll get sent directly to that email address. If you wanted to hook in and maybe you're doing something like a Zendesk or you just want to get that notification in Slack, whatever it is, you can actually hijack that uh, send support email handle function and you'll receive the from, the subject, the message, and uh, you can then make an appropriate you know, uh, post request to some uh, other service and then it'll get populated there so you can actually cut out email altogether. Um, so it's actually really nice to kind of swap those things out. Uh, the next thing is teams. Um, teams are what uh, Spark calls just groups of users, um, analogous to organizations in GitHub. Um, it's really simple to get started. You literally just add a can join teams trait on the user model, and um, that's it. They can start creating joining teams. Um, if you wanted to say, like, you cannot create additional teams, um, Let's say that they register a team and they have one team that they own. They can't go in and create a second team. You would just do the no additional teams. Um, and then if you didn't want to call teams teams, you can uh, set this in here to be uh, like organization. If we were GitHub, or uh, it's actually what our application calls it, just organization here. So it actually lets you customize really the entire facet. Uh, this is what the can join teams trait does just adds these functions. Um, uh, it really just kind of makes sense, you know, if they own the team or not. They have invitations to teams. You can kind of look at that. Um, and then there's a the current team property that um, will tell you the current team that the user is uh, logged into. So how it actually works is you have a user database table and a team's database table, and um, it's a many-to-many -many relationship, so you have a pivot table in the middle that connects the two, but you need an ID on the user table to tell you what you're currently looking at. So that would be like ID one for team number one and ID two for the second team. And what happens is um, when you switch your teams through the team switcher, you would actually uh, set that ID differently, and that's what you can use to kind of scope your queries or anything like that. So that's what that uses um, to tell you what the current team you're looking at. And if it's null, it means they don't belong to a team, and the middleware can actually catch that for you and kind of push them to a subscription page if you wanted to. You can also identify teams by path. Um, and what that identify teams by path does is on registration, it exposes the uh, team slug, and you can actually customize it if you want. It just defaults to like a, a kebab case with dashes. Uh, all lowercase, and that would actually be in the URL of the uh, of your application. And then you would actually have to put in the team slug in your routes, and you'd have to do some finagling because it's not written out of the box to handle this. Um, what you'd have to do is then use a the middleware to find the team slug, find the team, make sure that that currently off user belongs to that team, and then set that current team on that user, and then keep going or kick them out and say, you don't have access to this. Uh, the other way you could do it is by subdomain. Um, I never got it working. I was testing it out with Valet, which is uh, you know local hosting on the machine, and it doesn't support wildcarding, so I don't know. Uh, roles. Obviously, you have an owner if you create the team. 
Uh, the other default is a member role. You can create more. And um, then you can actually check if the user it has a certain role on that team. Um, it is one user, one role, one team. Uh, or The role is defined on that uh, pivot table between the user and the team, so you can't have multiple role, roles, but you can still check if like, they're a VIP or something. If you did not want to charge the teams and do team billing, you can still use the can join team straight um, and then just not do team billing. And then you can also constrain your plans to say max teams. So um, if you're if you have five teams and you try to create a new one, it'll say ah you can't you can't do that. Um, you have to upgrade or something. So that's a way to get around that. And then these are the events for uh, team related events. Um, if you wanted to, let's say you were charging per month, like per user per month, you can use the team member added and removed events, listen on those, and update the subscription quantity. Um, we actually use team member added to do some, queue up some jobs to make sure that they get initiated when uh, they log in for the first time. So it's pretty easy. Uh, another big thing for SaaS applications is two factor. Uh, that's what you do. You tell Spark you want to use two factor. Um, and out of the box, it supports Authy. If you wanted to use something else like Google Authenticator, you would just hijack the enable, disable, and verify functions. Um, or actually, those are classes, but you would hijack those and um, do another, use another provider, use different logic. And what that might look like is you would swap the enable two factor auth with enable two factor auth using Google. Um, and you would then write the handle function to do that. And examples of that provider implementation are already there. They're already in the framework because they support Authy. So you basically just, you know, copy it over and, and change the endpoints and you should be fine. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much walking the documentation very, very quickly, I understand. <laughs> um, but all of those things that you looked at are arguably complex or just annoying to do. And when you're trying to develop a new SaaS application, uh, or just a new application, you kind of get bogged down on the, on, the, on the details, you know, and you don't get to focus on your actual domain logic. So what Spark does is remove all of that um, as barrier to entry and just lets you kind of get started faster. But it may not be uh, something that you want because if you're not building a SaaS application or you already have a SaaS application that's out there that's making money that you don't need to refactor in any way, um, it's not a good fit if you're married to a payment provider and you don't want to spend time writing the code to get the new gateway in there. Uh, if you don't like Vue or if you want to use Angular or something, you still can, um, but maybe that's a, a barrier as well. And then there are other edge cases that it may just not be a good fit. But it is a great fit if you're building a fresh SaaS application. Um, if you are using Stripe or Braintree, if you like or want to use Vue.js, um, but also just source diving. Um, I'm sure many of us have spent money on resources and books and, and uh, screencasts and everything. Uh, this is a really great way for just 100 bucks to get access to a code base that a really well-respected developer has spent time and effort on, and you can just kind of watch it grow and watch the decisions that were made. We're in Spark. 4.0 right now, so you can kind of see the, the train from 1 to 4 now. Um, and so it's, it's really helpful for me to actually get a, a look into how the creator of Laravel would actually use Laravel to build uh, a boilerplate on top and then to keep going. So it's, I think, invaluable for that, especially at that cost. Um, and then a demo. Cool. So, um, yeah, we'll do Q&A after this. And let me see here. Have this open. So this is our uh, Helix. This is our application. I pop into uh, presentation mode. So this is that um, Spark service provider that we looked at a lot. And um, this is kind of the opinions of your application that you're setting in place. And so this is what is actually running in production right now. This is our contact information. So this will be appended at the end of emails. Um, you send out a little support email or something and it'll actually append this to the bottom. Um, this is our sus send support email. So it just goes to the support at um, address. 
is our list of developers. Um, I am in there. And then uh, we use the API. And this is where we started getting into um, some different ideas that kind of differ from the default. So we refer to our teams as organizations. Um, I changed the namespacing of the models to live in a models directory. So I had to tell Spark to use uh, models team and models user. Uh, otherwise, it would have uh, lost its mind. It uses a repository pattern to access the uh, current and groups of users. So uh, what I had to do here, what I wanted to do is on every um, page load, uh, access the number or access its permissions and make sure that I'm reading the most current permissions for this user. So um, I had to hijack the current call on this repository. And uh, if the user checks out, I load its permissions and I return that user back. Otherwise, uh, everything falls into line and I get the 401s or um, whatever responses I get. I also had to fix the search. Um, so this is, we'll get, I'll show you the interface, but this is a way for you to actually search through your users if you wanted to um, maybe see how a particular user is spending, you know, how much money they're giving you or whatever the case is. So what we wanted, by default, it requires a name and an email. We wanted a first name and a last name. Um, so we changed that, but we also had to tell the search function, hey, that name column doesn't exist, search through first and last name. Um, I actually need to change that to do all lowercase because it'll only work. It's case sensitive now. Um, so that was in the register method. That happens kind of um, before this booted method. And so now with the booted method, um, you see that we use Stripe. We don't require the card. We identify teams by path, which just means that in the future we could expose the team slug in the URL if we wanted. Right now we're not. Um, we have a free team plan. It's just beta, early access. We're not charging a dime yet. And uh, because of that name to first name, last name switch, I had to validate users differently. Um, and just, so on registration, it validates these fields with these um, rules. How to do first name, last name. Um, same exact thing for creating users. And you can actually see this. Uh, it just does Spark create users with. So it swaps out that functionality there for this functionality. The only thing that's different is first name, last name. And then, um, again, first name, last name issue springing up. We want to If you want to update your contact information when you're logged in as a user, uh, not only do we have to validate, we have to handle the update with those two new columns. Um, and this is just copied over from the actual implementation. I just made those two line changes and then fire off the same exact event so nothing changes. And that's pretty much it. That is our service provider uh, to set up uh, Helix as it gets working. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it. I think it might be more helpful to uh, how do I get out of here. Just kind of put names and faces to everything. So. Um, This is our dashboard that we built, um, and most of the stuff is for most of the stuff here is going to be like access, like on the outside type of thing uh, that Spark handles for you. So, you know, the logging in, the uh, all the stuff in the drop down. Um, so this is the drop down that comes with Spark. You can see access to the kiosk there, and then um, like for email support, this is the pop up that happens. Um, that's my email address, and then I could send off a message, and this will actually go through your email provider, whatever, like we're using Mailgun, so it'll just fire off an email if I wanted to. Um, I don't really want to do that, but it does work. And then, uh, so in the profile, you click on your profile, so you can actually change your profile photo if you'd like. Uh, you see this contact information uh, that used to just say name, but because we made those changes, it now looks different. Um, password fields. So that's all that is. And then, um, actually, let's go back to profile and look at organizations. So from this interface, I could create a new organization. If we employed the no additional teams, this interface would not exist. 
Uh, and then I can look at the organizations that I own or that I'm a member of. Um, it'll say the owner's name, but then, um, you know, a chance for me to leave the organization if I was, uh, if I could, you know, if I was the, uh, just a member, but because I'm the owner, I can delete it. That's cool. So account settings over here, this goes into, um, the kind of organization settings that we have. You can put a photo, um, if you wanted right now, it's just this weird thing. Uh, you can change the name and then you can look at who's all involved with it. So you can invite new people. You can see existing, uh, mailed invitations that have gone out. You can revoke those if you'd like. And then you actually have a list of who's in your organization. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then this is the notifications area. So with that little bell up at the top there, it basically just pulls out this drawer. And these are the notifications that are, um, that we created ourselves from within the application. And then um, this announcements would be where you created that announcement from the kiosk and it would show up here. So I'll show you what um, the Spark site has done where, uh, remember me. So up here, Spark was, act this Spark site was actually built with Spark, so it looks very familiar. Um, and here in the announcements, you can see that Taylor sent out an announcement eight days ago that said, hey, we've released an upgrade. And so that's what that body looks like. That's what the uh, action text would look like. And then there's actually a URL underneath it. Um, and you can, it'll just keep a, a list of everything. And when you actually open that up, it'll fire off a read to the appropriate table um, so that the little bell, there's, there's a little like dot on this thing that ends up uh, showing up when you have an unread and then it'll go away. So that's nice. Um, so let's hop into the kiosk here. This is one of the things that kind of blew me away out of the box support. Uh, again, a place to create the announcement. You kind of see what that would end up looking like. And then this is the metrics. Uh, we just launched this eight, nine days ago or so. And so we have no money. Um, nobody's uh, trialing it because we're all on this, like, f we're under that 10-day trial period, so nobody's actually trialing yet. Uh, but this is what our revenue looks like. It's just a graph. Obviously, it's flat. We have nothing in there. But we do have a little spike on the second. Yay. And we have, it'll tell you um, on the subscribers, that bottom pane at the, at the bottom there is uh, by plan that you have set up, uh, who, how many you have on there or not. Um, so this will give you a really good kind of uh, just overall clear picture of what's going on with your uh, application, how it's going. So the next thing you can do is on users. So um, we have one in here called Ellen. You'll see that if I search for Ellen, no results. But if I do E, capital, um, now it actually works because I need to fix that lowercase thing. Uh, this name should be first, last name. Haven't updated this, but nobody's going to see this except us, so I don't really care. Um, this should be a, a normal icon. So I can click in here, and I can actually look at her as a, as a user of this application. I can see the email she used when she joined, um, the subscription that she is on, and uh, any revenue that she might have personally brought in uh, that she's paying us. And then this up here, it's again hidden, but this is a... Uh, thing to actually impersonate her. So now I am Ellen. I can walk through all of this application as Ellen the user. Um, you can see up here, this changed from metric loop to saute. Uh, if I went down here, you can see this unread, and that's what that looks like. It actually grows. Um, this is the team switcher. So she's currently attached to saute. She could hop over to uh, metric loop, and then it would reload the page and you can see the organization in the top left changes. Um, and she actually has a chat notification for metric loop, but not for saute. So I'm going to put it back the way I found it. Um, so with great power comes great responsibility. I'm sure you heard about the, <laughs> I made this joke last time, but it was relevant then. It was when uh, Wells Fargo was signing up everybody for new accounts to clear their bottom line. Uh, you could technically do that, um, but don't obviously, ethical reasons. Um, so anyway, back up here at the top, I just have a little thing here where the developer kiosk was actually replaced with a uh, back to my account. So I do that. 
I log back out, and then I'm just here again. Um, and that's kind of a just a really quick walkthrough of the the stuff that Spark offers and has given us the ability to kind of uh, develop this quickly and kind of launch it and get it out there. So anyway, um, I guess that's it. I'm going to put this boring uh, Q&A thing up there. But anyway, thanks for having me. That's, that's Laravel Spark, a uh, little look into it. So uh, if you all have any questions, I would be more than willing to try to answer. So. Yeah. Um, so I know the stats only let you just put in only the mm -hmm. shell part or one time payment. Right. right. Built in. And that's and that's as a cashier, right? Not part. Um it it is using cashier like as the as the back end actually uh, so cashier is the the package that you can drop in to accept payments from stripe and maybe braintree um and so yeah that's kind of the requirement there um and i think you can use cashier for one off payments um you can just like issue a charge as opposed to like a subscribe to plan or something like that functionality is there but you kind of have to go hunting for it um, so you could do one-off charges um, if you wanted. You just kind of have to look a little bit. It's not readily available. It's not readily clear. But, yeah, it is It is possible. It's just not like if you're doing one-off charges, like maybe maybe you just use Laravel and Cashier with a one-off charge rather than this entire framework around it because you may not need it. Um, but, yeah, that is possible. Um. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if cashier is implemented like that. I want to say that there might be PayPal support if you're using Braintree. That would make sense. Yeah, Braintree does uh, support PayPal. Yeah, th maybe. Right. No, I, I, I. Yeah, I, I think that uh, cashier really only supports like credit cards, and maybe if you use the Braintree, it may support PayPal just because it's you know, they're owned or whatever. Um, but I think it's just credit cards okay. um, as, as far as I'm aware. But that'd be a really great feature request. Do you like Apple Pay and stuff in there? But, yeah. pff, you know. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, uh, let's see if I, hmm, that's probably a bad idea. I was going to just try to do a new Spark application, um, but maybe I can do this. No, I want to go here. So in this provider, um, I'll just comment this out. I'll just copy this. Mm -hmm. And I want to say price is 10. That's fine. What's happening here? Oh. So. <laughs> Let's see if this works. <coughs> Yeah, it, uh, refresh will run all of the downs and then run the ups uh, immediately. So it, it's basically a refresh without dropping the dropping tables or dropping the database. <coughs> <coughs> so.
So maybe profile. So here, because now it understands we have a paid plan, um, it'll open up a subscription thing. And then for billing, uh, this is what it would look like. It's literally just form fields. And then <clears throat> as you start as you start pulling the invoices, um, let's say you needed to include these things. Like as, as a user, I'm going to want to put like my full business name or something. That way, when the invoices get sent, um, it has this extra information if we need like the VAT ID or something if you're European. Um, so this right here is what you could do to like select to choose this plan um, and plan features. That's basically just the array drop down um, that or this pop up there. Uh, so if we go back in here and we want to copy this so we have a $20 plan um, and just give that a refresh, it'll just pop that. So now it's 10 a month and 20 a month. And now uh, we'll do first and second, and we'll put this. Uh, yeah, after you registered. So the other thing would be if you wanted to require the card up front, then all of this would be front and center okay. during registration. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So if you wanted to do like, you know, choose your plan and then start building something out, like you'd kind of have to hold that in memory yourself and then make the choices there. Uh, but yeah, this is basically just either going to sign up and get registered and it's either going to be paid or an unpaid entry thing. Um, so that's what that, yeah, in terms of like the order that it actually happens. Uh, so we'll just do... Yeah. So now we have a new tab, a new toggle up in the top right <clears throat> to switch between monthly and yearly options. And you can see that it's it'll change that uh, appropriately for you. So that's a really cool kind of feature out of the box. We haven't touched that code. You can probably tell it's bootstrap and it has different styling from the rest of the app. Um, so that, um, but that's just kind of, again, out of the box. You just type in those like nine lines and you're ready to go to start accepting money and then um, you know, if you wanted to say like this was five teams and then the next upgrade was 10 teams or something, you could do that um, to kind of clear that out. So, uh, yeah, I know that's kind of different than what you were asking, but I think the onboarding can be as involved as you want it to be, but uh, out of the box, it's, it's very much like choose a plan, get started, or get started and then choose a plan. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and actually what that, um, what that looks like, because it is kind of interesting the way that it's, uh, you may not be able to see that. Let me do this view again. So, oof. so uh, normal uh, structure here. Um, the only difference is here is a Spark folder. And uh, in the Composer JSON, you can see that my Spark requirement here is an at dev. And then um, down at the very end, I'm just telling the, the repositories to look at a path and then include whatever's in there, uh, which is in the uh, Spark folder. And so what ends up happening is uh, sp stuff goes, this is the, the code from Spark itself, this is what the repository looks like. And so it has install uh, stubs that it uses, and then um, it actually has uh, resources, uh, like all the view and JavaScript stuff. And then here you can actually hop in and look at the routes file. Um, now this is coming straight from Spark, so you see it has the middleware web, and it'll, terms of service, there's a, a specific controller to uh, show the terms of service and, um, you know, all the stuff. and this is just how that's built. These routes get loaded first, and then yours comes second. So 
what it does is you load everything out of there. Part of that Spark installer inside your um, resources and assets, JavaScript, there's components that we made and Spark components. So if it lives in resources, you own it, you can change it, no big deal. If it lives in the Spark folder, um, this is what's gonna get updated when you run Spark update. So uh, if you change stuff in here, it's really not gonna have an effect on your code. It's very frustrating. I've done that a handful of times because the file names are the exact same. So you make a change, you refresh, you do all the refreshing, you clear your database, you clear everything, and you realize you changed the wrong file um, because I didn't change the one in resources. So that's kind of how it's loaded. It's, it's injected locally into your um, folder hierarchy, and then um, those things are copied into your resources folder uh, where it gets changed. And um, I guess if the internet is sufficiently fast, We'll do a artisan spark update. I don't think anything is maybe, oh, maybe something changed, oops. So what this does is it actually tells, it actually looks at all the views that you've loaded and it'll say, ah, you've made a change to this. Uh, I'm not gonna touch it. So Spark doesn't wanna overwrite any of your code that you've written when it comes to views. Um, it will overwrite like the controllers that it uses because you don't have access to those. Um, and then, so it'll just skip all of these things that we've actually changed. And then it'll update the Spark directory so it's using the freshest code and then um, removing that directory and, and telling you that you're on the newest version. I think I just updated on accident. So we'll fix that later. But um, so that's kind of what it looks like. So you have your domain that you can, that you can work with and live in. Um, but then there is the stuff that you maybe use as reference or something. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, could you, uh, could you tell us what Helix is? Yeah, totally. It's, um, so it is a, uh, we want it to be a people management application, um, human activity management at, at some point we <laughs> called it. So, uh, what, what we want it to be is, a a place you can put all of your people and uh, any, basically any person that touches your company, whether you're selling to them, you're buying from them, or you're managing them as uh, they work for you or something. So here, um, it's kind of basic. We're rolling out new features. We really just wanted to get it launched because we were going to stay in development because I'm a perfectionist. Um, so we finally just picked something and chose to run with it. Um, so... Activity log, this little get started thing. These are the permissions that we've set up, and I don't know where to start. Uh, but the, the main kind of entry point is going to be this people thing. So if um, you wanted to have your people listed here, so I can actually come in here and look at employees. And so, like, I'm down here as an active employee. Uh, if I wanted to, I can look at um, this is my personal like employee page. Uh, I can look at this. It tells me I'm also a current admin or I could add another type if I wanted to be, uh, if I wanted to add that. Um, there's a place to just kind of collect different information. Um, and so what we do is you can see up in the top, we have a template and we also have a people area. So templates are where you say like, this is what employees look like as a template. And then you can go create people and tell them or associate them as uh, employees. And then uh, you have a fully functioning calendar. Um, there's no like alerts or anything, but it, it does handle like recurring events and stuff. If you needed to uh, create an event on February 16th, um, you can put information in and uh, invite other people. Like if I wanted to um, invite Nick to come with me, um, then you can do that, and he'll get a notification that he was invited to an event. So it's it's just kind of wrapping things up together. And then um, right now I'm a, an active employee. I could be updated to uh, change that to a non-active employee, and um, that would give me a, a different kind of uh, a view. Um, maybe there are some things that I don't care about if you're non-active, but I do care if you're active uh, when I'm kind of looking at your file. And then for templates, um, so we'll look at, uh, we, divide, we divide things into workers and persons for right now. And uh, what that means is a person is kind of exterior to your company. A worker is interior to your company. So we have uh, 
a, a, an employee here, and you can tell, you can see that we have this uh, contact information, and then we have a group of things within that contact information called Austin Office, and then within there, uh, you can edit these. And so, if you wanted, you know, to put city above everything else, it's all you care about. Um, these are just uh, input fields, so you can kind of collect information based on that. Um, and you can kind of edit the entire employee template. You can change the color. You can add different stages, um, stages of what we call active and non-active. And the combination of your template and your stage is what uh, makes your standing. So I'm a current admin. I could be a former admin um, or an active employee or whatever. So that's kind of the, the meat of what it does. It just gives you a place to put all of your people into... Uh, into the system and kind of give you a bird's eye view of everybody that you're interacting with. Um, and that's pretty much it. We also have a uh, a chat that looks totally, completely original uh, compared to anything else you've seen. Um, but that is all housed uh, locally here. Um, so if nobody's online. Um, but, you know, you could just kind of hop in and start talking and um, do that. It's not as fully featured as Slack by any means, but it is a way to kind of, again, put all of your people, if you're running a small company or something like that, into one area. Do you have a Google Apps integration? No, not yet. Or not at all. <laughs> um, no. What would that, just curiosity, like, what would that enable us to do? Um, if you connect your DApps account, mm -hmm. you can have it auto-create accounts for everybody who has an email address that you're, you know, your domain.com. Oh. That's pretty cool. That's really nice. I, I expect royalties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least a free subscription. <laughs> yeah, well, sign up now. You'll get grandfathered in for bury, being an early adopter. Yeah, so. Like, uh, they have a profile image set up and you can those things. Nice. I think this pulls uh, from Gravatar, maybe? I don't know. Who knows? Um, so, yeah, that's... That's what we built. It's It's been really fun. Uh, Spark made it a way lot easier to get started and kind of finish it. Um, we did have to kind of combat with Spark in a little way, uh, kind of like that. We want to customize how we collect information. We want first name, last name versus a regular name. So um, there are some things that uh, Spark may be a little bit annoying, but there's at least enough out there to say, like, ah, I know how to do this. I can, I can just swap this entire function out and, and get started um, and kind of go from there. So... Uh, yeah. Questions? Anything? Well, thank you very much. Yeah, totally. Thanks for having me.